great. After these technical hiccups, let's get started. Let's get started. My name is Chris Zimmerman. I'm here to talk about Redis JSON, a document DB in Rust. Um, I have about 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, right? So questions, please, at the end. I'm available in the hallway afterwards, so feel free to kind of grab me um, if you have any kind of topics or, dis or discussion points. First of all, I'm going to dedicate this talk to my son, Luca, who cannot be there. If you're watching the stream, Luca, this is for you. Second dedication is actually to something of the CTO team at Redis Labs, who are the people behind the code base. Who am I? Um, I don't go through all of the details. Suffice it to say, um, I help a lot in Frankfurt. Um, I'm an Arch package maintainer. Blatant, blatant plug, I'm going to run the Linux beer Wanderung this year in Kronberg. So if you have a week at the end of August, early September, to join about 20, 30 people for discussions, um, hackathons, presentations, hiking, and of course, beer, check out the website. Um, it's actually linuxbeerwanderung.com or monochrome c forward slash lbw, um, monochrome c com forward slash lbw 2020. Second plug, and then I'm going to finish with the plugs. I run a podcast. I just, we just posted the first episode. It's called Linux In-Laws. Domain has, has gone live yesterday. First episode will be aired on Hacker Public Radio, HPI's your go-to source, on the um, 13th of uh, February. Um, it's open source with a dark side humor twist thing. Plugs over. Um, <laughs> Hobbies include software, de software development life cycle. That's what I'm dealing with for the last, what, um, 20, 20, 25 years. I've been using open source for the last 30 years, 30 plus years. Um, I'm also dabbling in IT security. And if I still have the time, I work for a company called Redis Labs, full disclosure, um, as a solution architect and liaison. Um, Couple of things, basically, what this talk is all about. First of all, how many, ha how many of you have used Redis or know what Redis is? Wow, OK. Um, there are a couple of in intro slides. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, because if the majority is already familiar with Redis, there's little point in repeating these details. Then I'm going to talk about a, little, a little bit about the architecture, um, with a special focus on how applications perceive this document DB written in Rust, and of course, um, a summary and outlook will conclude this talk. Um, as I said, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Suffice it, Redis is, uh, Redis is suffice it to say, Redis is one of the kind of leading in-memory databases. It was about it was founded about, about 10 years ago. Um, we have more than 25,000 GitHub stars. There are more than 162 clients written in more than 57 programming language program languages, I reckon that makes Redis one of the most loved databases when it comes down to client connectivity. Um, how many of you actually have programmed a re against Redis? And I reckon most of you did this uh, in a caching use case, right? Or as part of a caching use case. This is basically where Redis comes from. About 10 years ago, the project initiator, somebody called Salvatore Sanfilippo, was looking for a performant um, reporting database uh, for one of his web um, um, projects. He checked out Memcached, he checked out other solutions that didn't check out. So he came up, he wrote his own database as a key value store initially. This is basically where Redis comes from. Does anybody know what Redis stands for? Remote Dictionary Server. This is what this is what this is it. But over the years, Redis have, has evolved into much, much more. In about 2015, Salvatore introduced something called the module SDK to the code base that allows um, the initial Redis server implementation to be extended with so-called modules, and Redis JSON is one of them. Um, the idea is to take your native Redis implementation and to, provide, and to plug any gaps that you may perceive from an application perspective with, with, uh, with functionality implemented in the modules. So over the years, um, there have been modules in the area of graph. Redis graph turns Redis into a very performant graph database. Full software compli um, um, compliant interfaces, similar to Neo4j. 
um, there's something called time series that turned Redis into a time series database comparable in functionality to something called InfluxDB and so forth. The beauty is that all these extensions are on GitHub. So if you're looking for a performance um, graph database, simply clone the Redis server site, clone the graph module, compile the whole thing, load the module when you start up the server, and then you have a full software compliant graph database in memory at your disposal. The idea was to turn Redis with these modules to turn Redis into something very application specific while maintaining the advantages that native Redis brings with it, namely low latency and high throughput. This is the, all I, this is the kind of um, idea. And the modules that you see on the screen are just the ones provided by Redis Labs. There are many more modules out there in the world or living on GitHub. Um, so if you, if you think Redis doesn't offer something that you need, simply deploy your favorite search engine and Google for a module extension. <laughs> Chances are somebody has written something that you can either clone or deploy natively, right, as in right away. Okay. Again, this is native Redis. I won't spend too much time on it, but this is what native uh, Redis offers out of the box. And the majority of the modules would fall back on these generic data types, including strings, sets, sorted sets, hyperlog lock, which is a probabilistic data structure, and so forth. Um, as I said, this comes with native Redis. This has been in the code base since pretty much day one. Most of the client-side implementations would reflect these data structures, either as part of their local ecosystem, as in library, client library side, or written um, um, in, in, uh, by an extension. And what is Redis JSON all about? Um, you have your native Redis, and then you have something called Redis JSON, which is essentially a, an ECMA 404 compliant module that turns Redis into a document oriented DB in functionality comparable to other document or oriented databases. <laughs> <laughs> if you see this Mongo, if you see this Couchbase, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, okay, you have your typical um, JSON commands that allow you to insert documents, that would be JSON set, that allow you to retrieve documents from a database, that would be JSON get, but also because JSON offers array and all the rest of it, um, you have JSON array append and JSON array insert, which allow you essentially to insert elements into a, an array and basically um, append them at the end. Um, the navigation is done via JSON path. Who, have you, who of you have used JSON path in the, in the past? Okay, not that many. Okay, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this. Uh, again, just deploy your favorite search engine of choice. Um, JSON path is, if, if you're looking for the specification, JSON path essentially is, in, is a standardized way, similar to a document object model, if you know what that means, as in a DOM, um, that allow you to access data, uh, to, that allow you to access data in a, in a JSON document. So essentially, if you write, and, and all of these kind of levels are separated by simple dots. Um, or you can use array notation to access these uh, level. So the following is equivalent dot foo dot bar. By the way, an initial period also always reflects the root of the DOM of the, object, of the document object model. That's, one, that's something very important to keep in mind. Um, so dot foo dot bar is um, equivalent to um, the first array in this in, the, in, uh, in this level, which is uh, with, uh, which comes after foo, which is essentially bar, or you can write um, all, or you can write it all in array notation, simple as that. And something very important, also you also find this in, in, in DOM query languages, is the support for wildcards. So um, if you are unsure about specific selector, just insert a, a star, for example, and you will get back the corresponding array, the corresponding document that reflects that path. How does it look like from the server side? Um, you have the native server, and this is generic, this is not Redis JSON specific. You have essentially the Redis server that is running on, by the way, what port? Can anybody tell me? 6379, right? Uh, very, something very important if you wanna, if you wanna access uh, Redis from the, from the outside, make sure that your firewall is open for that port or kind of fortified correctly. So 
um, all communication goes through a wire protocol called RESP um, between the server and the implementation on the client side libraries. And um, the client side pretty much looks similar to what is on the screen now in pretty much any programming language for which there is a Redis client. Um, essentially, you have a small wrapper around a socket interface, which is called High Redis. Written in C, highly performant, does little more than just wrapping socket access. On top of this, you have language-specific bindings. As I referred to earlier, Redis is supported by more than 57 programming languages. So each and every programming language has at least one, if not more, clients. The problem or the issue, the challenge with these programming languages, they're all different. You have Go, which is compiler-based. You have Python, which is, Py sorry, you have Python 3, very important these days. <laughs> you have Python 3, which is interpreter-based. Um, you have native C, or you have C++. For all of these programming languages, for all of these programming languages, there are clients at library implementations, but they're all different. So there's an abstraction layer, essentially implementing the interface layer to high Redis, but that can understand the semantic, the specific semantics, the specific interfaces towards the programming language of choice and, and including the runtime environment that this programming language uses. On top of this, you also have module-specific bindings. If you go to um, oss.redislabs.com, you'll see a list of modules, as I said, that Redis Labs put out there on GitHub. And most of them would have a Python, a Go, and maybe a JavaScript implementation right from day one. So th these are the kind of the basic interface libraries you find for the modules. Needless to say, these module-specific client-side implementations would use the language-specific bindings in order to talk to the server, uh, which, of course, then requires a module to be loaded if the, inter if, if the client-specific um, bindings um, sh um, should work. Um, let's take a look at how this is done for Redis JSON. Um, essentially, this architecture depicts a performance benchmark that I'm going to go into as, a, as part of a later um, as part of a later part of the presentation. So I'm going to just spend some time on describing the architecture. Um, you have the module-specific bindings, language-specific bindings, and then you have a high Redis, as explained before. And on top of that, you have a small layer called JRedis JSON. That, and this is then used by a, dat by a database performance benchmark framework called YCSB, probably known by most of you who are looking for performant databases, because it's essentially it stands for Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. It's a standard benchmarking framework for databases, simply to TCP, if that rings a bell, only concentrating on NoSQL databases, because Redis is a NoSQL database, right? Um, so the, um, the idea is to extend um, y YCSB with a thin driver um, that talks to the, doc, uh, the object or the, um, the document oriented database and it does through, through and, and it does so through the ordinary architecture specific stack on the server side this is reflected you have the um, native redis server written in C as in you can pull it down from github it's all written in C it's um, there I used version 505 for this but more on this later um, then you have something called the module SDK which written in, 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 in C, has been, has been there for the last couple of years, as explained. The trouble, of that with, uh, the trouble with that, of course, is that you cannot use this really from, from Rust right away. This is the reason why, why Redis Labs created something called a module crate that essentially wraps the module SDK in, a Rust, um, in, in Rust bindings. As you probably know, um, to call C from Rust, uh, you have to tweak it a little, bit, a little bit. Essentially, you have to say, now look, dear Rust compiler, this API is not safe because the usual uh, memory, <coughs> memory management techniques, as in sole concept of ownership and all the rest and borrowing, and well, you are Rust experts, you know this, do not apply to C code. So the idea behind the module crate is essentially to wrap the module SDK in something that Rust can understand. And um, then you have the remaining code base written in Rust, 
talking to this module crate, which then in turn talks, talks to the module SDK, which in turn talks to the server internals. By the way, um, this is Redis JSON 2. The first implementation called Redis JSON was written in C, as we can see in a couple of minutes when I'm going to, when I'm going to go through the performance aspects between these two code bases. Okay, um, the original implementation, some figures. The original implementation had about 5.2 kilo lines of code. Uh, the new implementation is about 3.2 line, kilo lines of code. Um, what were the main decision points for re-implementing the already existing Redis JSON extension in Rust? First of all, um, yes, the, the native code base of Redis is written in C. But as probably most of you know, aging C code um, is sometimes or somewhat hard to maintain, especially if it's been around for a while. So C code bases bring, especially for new members of a team, a learning curve with them, plus also do not necessarily help with the overall total cost of ownership or something called technical debt. Um, so there was a decision being made to going forward that the new implementation language for any m new modules or re-implementation of, ex of existing ones like Redis JSON would be done in Rust. The idea was to have a more compact code base, and I think this, the, the figures kind of reflect this, with a, le with a lower technical depth and very important with a lower QA effort because there are fewer lines of code that need to be tested um, and of course, that leads to a lower overall total cost of ownership when it comes to when it comes down to maintaining and extending the code base. And of course, um, something important when you're working for a company that sells support around this and other services, um, time to market comes down to something that may be important for the business side of things. This is the reason why it was a conscious decision about two years ago to go forward with Rust rather than C when it comes down to native implementation of modules. Um, a little bit of experience when um, we had, when we engaged with this re-implementation of the new code base. The team had quite a diverse background. Some of them were coming, many of them were coming from C. Some had some, had some Java background and, and, and also Golang was, was present, but so, the, background was pretty diverse when it comes down to programming language. And uh, the reason why up to then the main implementation language of choice was C, because A, the module SDK being present already was written in C, and of course the remaining server code base has been written in C. That's the reason why natively um, it was pretty much a no-brainer in the beginning to use C as the implementation language for any modules being developed inside Redis Labs. Um, but um, going forward, as I said, for the reasons explained, Rust was chosen for as the new uh, technology to implement modules. So some lessons learned from the team that engaged on re-implementing Reddit JSON 2. Yes, Rust does have a steep learning curve. Um, just hands up, how many have used Rust um, more than two or three years? So you can probably reflect this, especially if you haven't you, if you if you haven't put up your hands. That means you're kind of still learning first, I reckon. Uh, so you know what this is all about with regards to uh, memory management can be tricky at times. I'm talking about the board checker. Uh, somebody about a year ago told me if you have convinced the board checker, or if you have if you have convinced the Rust compiler to generate code, you're halfway there. In contrast to C, where this is slightly different. Okay, but now the plus sides. A pretty comprehensive ecosystem. If you take a look at what's out there on crates.io, that's a lot. You have at least um, five web frameworks to choose from. You have crates for um, socket access. You have crates for um, Rust itself is self-hosted. So you have actually crates for ASTs as an abstract syntax tree and all the rest of it. So <coughs> chances are, like Python, you take a look at what's out there if you are if you want to program a new code base and simply reuse the stuff that is or that has already been written. So this is a major advantage when it comes down to implementing new systems because essentially, as with other any open source projects, you are resting on the shoulder of giants. Simple. Um, responsive community. 
if you take a look at rustlang.org, at rustlang especially at the forums, um, it's amazing. When I started to learn Rust, there was always somebody out there helping me. Never mind how stupid the question was, if there are any stupid questions. Um, you will get support. So in contrast to other communities, Rust, and I think this is one of the, major, uh, of, of the big advantages of, of, the, of the community and the language, has been pretty responsive and pretty supportive. And this is reflected um, by what the, um, um, what the um, development team basically experienced when they first started to, to this, this enterprise of basically programming something in Rust. And of course, the toolchain support is awesome. Um, not only you have different um, tool chains at your disposal, better, stable, and of course nightly. If you want to check out new features, you simply switch um, to a new uh, uh, tool, tool, chain, tool chain version and off you go. But something pretty important, cargo, best example, right? It's not only a build system, it's a package man management, management system all wrapped into one. I've yet Maybe apart from Golang, I've yet to find a programming language that does it all in one go. Maven for Java came later, and it took the Java people a long time to get it right, my, my opinion, before any Java people kill me after this presentation. <laughs> uh, no, uh, jokes aside, um, Mozilla decided about 13 years ago that they, needed, that, they, that they needed a new programming language because C and C++ as in the code base then in place for the rendering engine didn't cut it anymore. Um, so Rust was developed first commit, I think about 11 years ago, if I'm completely mistaken, but they did it with intelligence this time around. And you'll see this if you take a look at the toolchain support at the, at the ecosystem and people picked up, it, picked up on it pretty quickly. It took Python about, I reckon, 15 to 20 years to where Rust is now within, within the short amount of, ta uh, of 10 years. And that's pretty amazing, I think, for a programming language. Um, more info on our beloved Yahoo Cloud serving, serving Benchmark. As I already said, it's written in Java. It's a standard framework. So the idea is that you have quite a few um, DB integration uh, layers as part of the native code base when you clone it from GitHub right away. Um, Redis is, of course, supported out of the box. So is Hadoop, Mongo, Couchbase, um, even some graph database and all the rest of it. Uh, so the idea is basically, if you want to take a look at um, how, how, your, how your implementation, how your um, ecosystem, when it comes down to NoSQL, is performing, you simply, click, you simply clone the code base, you compile it, and then you can start testing. If and that was the case when we started off on this performance benchmark exercise. If there's no um, integration with your new NoSQL database yet, it's, it's, it's not that difficult because you simply implement four, actually five methods in Java that talk to the respective clients at library implementation, and then you're good to go. Um, so the idea is basically you have inserts, you have updates, you have deletes, and then you have writes and you have scans, plus maybe initialization and finalization of the database connection, but that's about it. So the implementation of the Redis JSON extension that talks to Redis JSON is about 200 lines of Java code. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, so not a big deal. Don't fret if your, if your database is not in, on the list of, or of the already supported NoSQL databases, writing that interface layer is not that hard, apart from using Java, of course. But that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, YCSB has the concept of workloads. There are five workloads that all reflect different use cases. Um, for the purpose of this benchmark, I used about three of them. So um, they range from A to F, goes without saying. So um, they all reflect different kind of um, access patterns on the client side, if you will, as, a, as I said, different use cases. So workload A would reflect your um, vanilla kind of um, cycle in terms of you have 50% of writes, you have 50% of reads that hammer onto the database. Then you have workload B. Um, that has a more caching-oriented um, access pattern. Namely, you have about 
um, 95 percent of the database accesses would be read, uh, would be reads and only five percent would be writes and then you have your bread and butter workload which is f that typically that, that, that reflects a typical CRUD circle as in you read a data record you modify it and then you write it back um, so for the for the purpose of this benchmark, this is basically what I focused on. Especially interested in workload number B because this is where the where, where this caching thing comes from originally about ten years ago. Um, how much time do I have left? Uh, Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Okay, plenty of time. Okay, cool. So we can spend some time on the analysis of this. First of all, um, some 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 specs. Um, I used a stock. Ewan, uh, as in the latest Ubuntu release, and the machine I ran it on is actually a Dell XPS 13 that has a mobile i7 um, with about 16 gigabytes of RAM and it's 512 gigabytes of SSD. And the number of records that I used um, is actually around 1 million. Um, bear in mind that these figures expressed in seconds um, of course, can be scaled if you move to a different server specification, goes without saying. I travel a lot, so I use that machine that I'm presenting from as my go-to server in inverted commas. I use Redis 505 as a kind of reference architecture. You see that in the first, in the first line, basically to see how Redis JSON scales up against nat the native Redis implementation. And the native Redis implementation is already, as I said, part of the YCSB code base. And then I used Redis, uh, Redis JSON as in the C implementation, and I cloned this on the 2nd of January 2020. And one day later, I cloned the Rust version. Um, the reason for um, the one day delay was that my internet essentially broke down on the second after I, I after I cloned the C code base and then I was traveling and then I had internet access back again next day so that's the reason um, for that one day delay but I took a look at the commits and there were no commits in between so that's the reason why um, pretty important because I'm measuring only Redis. I'm not measuring or Redis JSON. I'm not measuring Mongo. I'm not measuring Couchbase. I'm not measuring any other NoSQL DB, no, no SQL DB as part of this benchmark. So I left it at in memory, man in memory management only. So there was no persistence um, configured. Um, if many of you have used Redis, you know that Redis has two, persistent, uh, two types of persistence, namely append-only files as well as snapshots. I didn't use any of them because I want to keep it straight and I just want to confine it to Redis. So I simply said, now look, Redis, do your thing in memory as you have been doing for the last 10 years. Let's take a look at the native implementation first to get some sort, some, some feeling of how Redis is measuring up. Um, the number of threads, you can configure that when you run your YCSB invocation. The number of threads essentially reflect or kind of model the number of applications hammering onto that database instance. As you can see, and this is implemented by pure Java threads, thank you, pure Java threads uh, on the client side implementation because this is what YCSB uses when it comes down to accessing or simulating access to the server side implementation. So uh, one thread, four threads, and eight threads. Bear in mind that this is only a mobile um, quad core, so um, you're looking at essentially a dual core with hyperthreading. That's something important to keep in mind. Already at the kind of Redis level, we'll see a spike in performance when you move from one to four threads. This slightly goes up if you move to eight threads, because that's what you see when you hammer with multiple databases, uh, so when you hammer with multiple clients onto a single database instance. Um, and that's actually workload A, and what is also, and this is reflected also in the, in the remaining workloads. Um, what I'm a little bit surprised about, and I haven't done a quite thorough root cause analysis yet, why the um, performance for eight threads is actually higher on the native Redis level rather than four threads. So I reckon it's down to something called the JEDIS interface that is used when accessing native Redis in, in YCSB. JEDIS is one of the, is one of the standard Java clients. 
apart from lettuce and something called Redison. And as I said, I'm suspecting that this is basically down to, 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 to the Jettis implementation. I used 3.2. Um, the, the commit was fairly, the, 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 the tagging of the release was fairly recent, so I reckon there's something, there's something fishy maybe, maybe in that, in that Jadis version. Switching over or comparing this to Redis JSON as in the native C implementation of the document DB, you will see the price you pay from, when switching from native Redis to Redis, uh, to Redis JSON, i.e. the overhead, the, the, the performance penalty that you pay in inverted commas when you actually use that module uh, giving you document-oriented functionality. And as you can see, um, it's not that much at the end of the day because essentially you're looking at 30% multi-threaded um, and, even, and even less when it comes down to a single thread. Um, and now it gets really interesting because the comparison, the comparison between Redis JSON and Redis JSON 2 essentially tell you the performance penalty when using a Rust code base in comparison to a C code base. So this is the impact that you have when you go from C to Rust. I'm slightly simplifying, but you get the drift. Let's take a look at the numbers. Um, work, um, let's, let's pick a random workload. Let's pick workload A. The performance penalty that you pay is quite is, is quite minimal because essentially you're looking at 44 versus 49 seconds. That's five seconds difference. But at the, uh, on, on the other side, you gain all the benefits that come with Rust. This is why this comparison for this particular use case is quite revealing, I think, uh, when you are um, facing the decision what implementation language to use for your next product, uh, project. Would that be Rust? Would that be C or C++? Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it here because we have, we have about, what, 10 minutes left, something like that. So there's still more, some more slides. Um, the slides, of course, will be um, on the website. So free, free um, to take a second look, to do some further analysis. Um, the code will be on GitHub very soon, more on that later. And feel free to get in touch if you have further, if you have further questions on this. Okay, um, short recap. Redis JSON, of course, is a document oriented to be an ex is, is, is an extension basically of Redis, and this is purely aimed at, or the primary use case is in memory processing. So the focus is on what Redis co comes with natively, performance and, and low, uh, high performance and low latency, as in maximum throughput. Um, and of course, because it's based on Redis, you have the full cap triangle at your disposal. Sorry, a cap, anybody doesn't know, doesn't know what cap is? Okay, great. Uh, sorry, yes. Um, Bruce theorem, it's the, it's the triangle between um, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Essentially, um, from acid right up to um, maybe, co um, may, maybe coherence, something like this. Um, so essentially, acid doesn't, uh, of course, acid should ring a bell. So this is acid is your typical SQL based use case, as in you have a transaction that either fails or succeeds, nothing in between. Many, as it turns out, many applications don't, do, do, not, do not have to use that strong consistency notion. So that's the reason why you, sp you especially see this in the NoSQL space, that more and more applications move away from this strong asset compliance. And Redis, with the, um, with the different types of persistence, with the in-memory focus and some, and thank you, and, and, uh, and the other benefits, of course, allows you to move in that triangle based on your use case pretty freely. So... Um, this is basically the, the advantage of, of this NoSQL approach. Um, the outlook is um, we're going to integrate this, and you'll see this when you take a look at the, at the code base on, on GitHub already. Um, there's a module called Redis Search, which essentially is a full-text search engine, also based on Redis, of course, that allows you to have the functionality of a real-time index in memory at your disposal. Many people use it, as far as I've seen, basically to implement something called like an in-memory search engine, because that's what it, what it is for. So you take a document, you let it in there, you, you let Redis search in index the whole thing, and then you can basically search for your, um, for your index terms 
or for, for, for your search terms on, on, on that index. So the idea is basically to combine Redis search um, with Redis JSON, which up to the time only supported JSON as a query language or JSON path as a query language. And of course, other functionality improvements um, regard extending the functionality currently implemented in Redis JSON 2, um, plus of course, API extensions. Um, so yielding at the end of the day, at a document DB that is fully indexable uh, in real time. So that's the, over, that's the overall idea moving forward. Um, before we come to the questions, a couple of links. Um, on redis.io, you find the full Redis documentation. No need to tell you that because you know this already. Um, RedisJSON.io reflects the reference documentation that is out there for Redis JSON and Redis JSON 2. By the way, the API is not is is the same. Um, so whether you are talking to Redis JSON or Redis JSON 2, it doesn't matter, and it will always be the same. So if we ex if if we extend Redis JSON 2, these uh, changes will also be reflected in Redis JSON for the time being. Um, you will have the code base on GitHub. There's of course the code base for Redis from Salvatore, maintained by Salvatore Sanfilippo on GitHub, on GitHub as well at his, at his handle called Antirez. Um, you'll find the YCSB cloud, uh, cloud server benchmark also on GitHub. Um, as soon as I get around to it, I'm going to issue a pull request for the, for the Redis JSON interface layer. So if Brian accepts this, you'll have a native y, YCSB in, uh, integration out of the box on GitHub. And of course, there's also something called the Redis Labs University. Um, just two sentences on that because this is not a commercial presentation. It's essentially a university, an online university where you can get to know more about Redis, um, both from a developer as well as administrative perspective. It's free of charge. Simply register, create an account, uh, enroll in a course, pass the exams, pass the homework, and you get a certificate. Any questions before we close it off? Yes? Uh, can you make a module that uses another module so you can move part of your application in the server? Um, yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, the question was, um, can you nest modules, essentially? As in, can you move business logic onto the server side? Yes, you can. Um, there's something called Lua, which is a scripting extension for Redis. But there's also an upcoming module. It's in, it's in technical preview at the moment. It's called Redis Gears. Redis Gears allows you to take your, at the moment it's only Python, allow you to take your business logic code in Python and move it off to the server. So your, your Python script is then executed as part of a Python, as part of a Python implementation running on the server. Um, you can also do this with uh, module functionality, although I haven't, I haven't seen this yet. Rust. Um, question is, it hasn't been done that. From a, from a functional perspective, I don't see any reason why, as long as you stick to the, to the module crate, goes without saying, because essentially this is what you use when you access this, the module SDK, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't do this. But as I said, the POC still remains to be done. Any other questions? You had a question, right? Uh, how much production ready is the uh, Redis JSON 2? Is it just uh, um, functionally complete? Is it already optimized? Is it uh, where in the life cycle? Of yes, the thank you. The question was how ready is Redis JSON 2? Um, we, uh, Redis, uh, we, as in Redis Labs, released this last year. Um, the commits have been mostly bug fixes. So um, I know quite a few projects who use this already in production. So the answer is it's ready for prime time now. Okay. Needless to say, um, PRs are still accepted, I think. So if you have further improvements, let us know. Other questions before we close it off? Yes. Is the performance of updating a JSON document repeatedly similar to the performance of creating a new doc JSON document each time, or is it similar to the performance, or is it faster? Um, the, the question was, is, is the performance um, equal between creating a new um, 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 JSON document or just updating one? Um, essentially, the idea is 
uh, if you are updating one, uh, you basically have to modify the contents. That, of course, includes a query in terms of where you want to stick in the uh, stick in the new content. So, I don't have exact performance benchmarks, but I, based on the on the on the already kind of native performance implementation, I wouldn't expect that overhead to be really significant. Um, but as I said, having 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 <clears throat> having not done the performance benchmark for this particular use case, let's see. Another questions? Another question? Okay. In that case, I would like to thank you for your time, and enjoy the code.